Hello everyone, welcome to the Comics Cube. My name's Paul and I'm here with my friends Dui and Lamar. And today we are going to talk about what got us into comics, why we became comics fans. Mm. Anything to keep us away from drugs. Yes. <laughs> That's basically it. Yeah. It's either that or drugs, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to start with Dui. So Dui, what got you into comics? Man, so um, this is so hard for me to answer because I have an older brother, right? And uh, as I understand it, when he was, a, see, he's five years older than me. Uh, when he was a kid, before I was even around, my our grandpa would just buy him comics. So this was at a time when... um. You could buy comics, like original American comics from from a random store for like what is now the equivalent of maybe 40 cents. Um, but, 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 but there was a local publisher that would also repackage comics. Like, just, they would just reprint it on, like, cheaper paper and stuff. And they would always just be the most random comics. So, like, we had uh, we had the issue of, like, Captain America Mad Bomb, you know, the, when Kirby came back to Marvel. Mm -hmm. Of course, with absolutely no context as to what that was or, or to who mm -hmm. Kirby was. But, like, that's it. We didn't have the succeeding issues or the ones before yeah. that or anything. Yeah, so stuff like that. Um... So, when I was young, there was just always comics around, right? It, But if I were to say what comics, like, really kick-started it for me, I think it was issues of who's who in the DC universe. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> with, with those covers, uh, most of which were drawn by George Perez, mm -hmm. some of which were not. And that's a huge part of that is because, you know, it was airing on TV at the time. At the time, the Philippines wasn't getting um, series at the same time as everyone else. We would get them like a couple of years later, three years later. So this is like 1986, you know, it was airing on, on TV at the time that I was reading Christ, um, who, Who's Who in the DC Universe. Was it Super Friends? It was the Super Friends! <laughs> <laughs> Super <Man. laughs> So, then all of a sudden, you get Who's Who, and you're like, who the hell is this? This is so awesome! Welcome to Superman! <laughs> um, and that, I would say, is what got me into comics. At the same time, my brother was also getting um, John Burns Man of Steel, <laughs> which, as we, as is well documented in my adult life, I don't actually like it. But as a kid, when you see how John Byrne draws Superman, mm -hmm. it's just awesome. <laughs> and then uh, he also had a random issue of George Perez's Wonder Woman. It's the one where Wonder Woman has a dream about Superman. Superman factors in very heavily <laughs> to why I'm a comics fan. Um, so I did not actually read Crisis on Infinite Earths until many years later, which is ironic because when I mention all of that, I really do feel it was Crisis on Infinite Earths that got me into comics. Right? Like, I think you could make a case for that, even though I didn't read it until much later. But I'm sure we'll get to that at some point. Well, Crisis wasn't collected for a surprisingly long time, was it? I don't think it was, and I did not read it as a paperback when I finally did. Did you find the individual issues? like? I think I was 14. I think it was like 1998, right? Right. A new comic shop had opened near me, which was like... You could tell, because like the, the other comic shops... We had like two big comic shops in the Philippines. One was called Phil Bars because it was owned by a guy named like Phil Barrow or something. And the other one was called Comic Quest. Um, which was, a, they were a little bit more knowledgeable when it came to comics. 
Um, and then in like 1998, very near me, there opened up a shop called Comic Odyssey, which got its name because they saw Cosmic Odyssey, the series once, and they said to cover up the wow. S, which is much like I did with a Comics Cube and the Cosmic Cube. So, you know, I'm not judging. So I walk in there with my mom because um, it was just in the middle of a mall. And then I see the complete edition of Crisis on Infinite Earths all packaged together every single issues for what i believe was like the equivalent equivalent of 50 dollars. wow which i'm sure was a steal back then right and it was like the first week of december or something fast forward a few weeks later my mom gives me and my brother a christmas gift i open it up as Christ is on Finn Earth. And of course, my brother's older, so he's like, I'm reading that first. <laughs> so we take seats. He reads issue one. Once he's done with issue one, he hands it over to me. He starts reading issue two. We finish it in a day. <laughs> Crisis on Infinite Earths got me into comics, and I didn't read it until, you know, 12 years after I was into comics. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to me as a big Superman fan that. You know, you, Man of Steel is in the mix there. Because um, I think Byrne's kind of style and what concerns Byrne as a writer is very much what concerns kids, isn't it, of, of a certain age, in that sort of like, um, oh, th this has this weirdly specific thing has to make sense, you know? And, and like... It's possible. So, <laughs> so I can't find the other one. But I also had this book. Oh, cool. Uh, so this book is called Superman, the Mightiest Hero in the Galaxy. It was published by Tempo Books. And it just reprints comics in, like, this format. Well, let me turn off. Black and white, like. In, like, yeah. yeah. So, oh, like, yeah, it's yeah. in that format. It just cuts up all the panels, right? Which is, I guess, a good thing that there are no Neil Adams comics in here. Um, <laughs> you, so this comic starts off with the life, uh, the story of Superman's, the complete story of Superman's life. Superman's mermaid sweetheart. That's right. right. I knew about Lori Lamars. <laughs> At four years old, I knew about Lori Lamars. Superman's greatest secret. I don't remember what that was. Um, Oh, it's just an, it's just a whole thing about how Lois tries to find out who's Superman. The Legion of Super Villains. <laughs> the Legion of Super Villains and when Superman lost his memory. Oh yeah. The yeah. other one I have of this is colored. It's also the same size, but it's colored and it's got the Galactic Golem, the Sand Superman. Um, which I didn't realize was a big deal at the time. I didn't know who Neil Adams was, right? Mm -hmm. And like a story by Jerry Conway and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez where Superman fights Solomon Grundy and he tricks him by dressing up as Solomon Grundy from Earth 1 because Solomon Grundy's <laughs> from Earth 2. He tricks him by dressing up as Solomon Grundy from Earth 1 and then Solomon Grundy is like, oh, now I have found a friend. Where shall we go? And then Superman's like, we shall go to the moon where we can live in peace. And then, because, you know, Solomon Grundy can't fly, he takes Solomon Grundy to the moon and then leaves him there. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's awful. So all of that, right? All of that, I had like Kurt Swanish Superman, Neil Adams Superman, Luis Garcia Lopez Superman, and Burn Superman all at the same time. Wow. And none of I'm like, this is this is why I don't bother with con with people who are complaining too much about continuity. Cause to me it was like, well. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, super friend Superman and my adventures with Superman and and Justice League Superman aren't the same Superman. I don't care. Yeah. I feel like I've talked too much now. <laughs> so. No, no, no. This is I, I got one more question to ask you before we go to Lamar. When did you find yourself um branching out from superheroes to other stuff? 
It must have been. Oh yeah, it was this this book. Um, so I've been reading this with my girlfriend Minnie, um, with you know, as a regular thing on the Comics Cube. I borrowed this from the library, from the school library, uh, in I must have been in eighth grade. So while it does have the first appearance of Superman in Action Comics number one, first appearance of Batman, um, it also has three stories of Will Eisner's The Spirit. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. um, which are amazing. And also four stories from EC Comics, including the legendary master race oh uh which is a huge influence on frank miller yeah that, that, look, oh, that yeah. looks like it comes See right it. out of a frank miller comic right there right yeah so so it was this and i was like oh now i gotta read more of this and then i you know i tried things that i didn't really super get into like uh, Love and Rockets. I still haven't really gotten into Love and Rockets or anything. But uh, there are things that are in superhero comics that I love, like Stereos Polyp, you know, anything Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips work on, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, I am a huge fan of Donald Duck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there we go. And I like even back then I was like reading Archie, mm -hmm. yeah, which is funny that's because like I never even think about it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's interesting to me because you know for people in not just in America but obviously in the Philippines too, you know Archie's such a thing that you didn't you didn't even think about. Oh yeah, and I read Archie, you know, but yeah. like Archie's like non-existent culturally speaking in the UK. You really. Know? Even yeah, with yeah, Riverdale yeah. on the air, really? Well, now people know it from Riverdale, but Archie Comics isn't a thing your average person on the street would... Uh, like in work, um, I was talking to some teenage girls a couple of years ago, and they were really impressed that mm -hmm. I... Because uh, they were talking about Riverdale, and I mentioned Jughead, and they were really impressed that I knew who Jughead was, because um, they thought it was just Riverdale, you know? yeah. And then I started telling them about Archie comics and they were less impressed. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, like culturally speaking, the Philippines is the only country in the, in Asia that was colonized by America. So, and I think on, another uh, the reason I, I never even think about it because Archie was so ubiquitous, like, you know, if you could ask girls here if they read comics and they would say no and then you'd be like but i'm sure you read archie and they're like yeah uh because you know it's it's sold in digest form in like grocery stores and wherever it's just so easy to pick up read and then you'll forget about it and you won't think about it for like until the next time mm. it it's i i don't think it's designed to make an imprint mm. right it's not like oh yeah i'm such an archie collector yes yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to wear an Archie shirt the way I wear a Superman shirt. <laughs> it's so American, isn't it? Like, uh, spe specifically of its time and of its place that I, I think there's not much there for British people to connect with, maybe. And I also don't, I also think, um, you're right, I do think it's of its time. Because I do yeah, think yeah. that uh, whenever I read new Archie things, I'm like... Even the older stuff that existed before I was born was better than the stuff I was reading. <laughs> it's it's definitely of it's it's definitely of its time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Fantastic. <laughs> so there's Doe's Secret Origin there. It's time for Lamar's Secret Origin. <laughs> <laughs> so Lamar, same question. Oh my goodness. What got you into comics? <laughs> um you know. Like as far as like you know comic books, um, we and I'm not counting like the the dailies and stuff that would come in the newspaper strips and everything because I always loved those, and you know like my favorites, you know because back then you know they were still running like Spider Man and stuff like that in the in the newspapers and stuff, so I was always into that. 
I was always into, uh, which are still like my favorites. Like it's like the stuff that like all the kids wouldn't read. So like while everybody was reading like Beetle Bailey and, you know, and, and all of that and Prince Valiant and all of that, like I used, I loved uh, Rex Morgan, MD. Oh God, and, you're a Mary and, Worth and Mark fan. Trail. Yeah, mm -hmm. No, not Mary Worth. No, no, no. That was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Mark Trail, that was dope to me. Like I, I still read them. Right. But yeah, uh, when I got into comics, like where I grew up at, you know, we didn't have like a comic shop. So you the only way you had access to them, like to go into the store and get stuff every month, you had to actually go to like a corner store or like like uh, the grocery store or something like that because they would have the racks of magazines and they would have like limited stuff, but it was always like the popular stuff. They always had Batman. They had uh, they had a Superman title. Usually it was action comics and the X -Men. Just, you know, yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff, right? Because you're talking like the early 80s. So this is when like this is after like giant size X-Men. So, you know, you know, X-Men was in like a boom. So you could get that stuff. And then. uh, You know, but I was more drawn to like the older comics because, you know. Where I come from, you know, we're big on like flea markets and yard sales and and stuff like that. Right. So. Uh, like me and my dad, you know, on the weekends, we would go and we would just go to like yard sales and stuff. And, it, you know, he would be looking for records and I would be looking for records and comic books. Right. So uh, you could always find like these chewed up comics, but they were like older. So that's when I actually got into like the like the JSA because there were some JSA comics, but they were beat to crap. You know, like I wasn't thinking about it like, hey, you know, these comics are like from the. 40s or whatever and but you know i wasn't thinking about it like that i just liked it the art was cool to me so yeah i had come across like a stack of those but they were like they were chewed up and beat up they didn't have covers and none of that so the, the guy was just like um he saw me going through them and he, he just told my dad he was like man uh just you know it was a stack of them like this and he was like man if he loves them things man just you know because they ain't gonna do nothing sitting around here so if he likes them, man, just give me a quarter. He can have all of them, you know? So it was that kind of thing, you know? And That's so awesome. I, yeah, That's man. Awesome. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I went home, man. And, and I didn't even have a concept of like going to the store and like paying, like, you know, you, you know, comics are like a couple bucks. So, you know, I was never, I really wasn't paying full price for anything. So I didn't really have that unless like my mom or somebody would bring me one from the store or something. But, yeah, so that's what did it. And then um, when you get to the 80s, you know, they had the, uh, y'all remember that comic, The All-Star Squadron? Yeah. You remember yeah. that, right? Okay, so you remember that, I think it was issue 35 where they brought back like all of these old superheroes and stuff. So you have like, um, it was like Uncle Sam and a couple of like the other, like older ones and they were there, they were having this big meeting or whatever. And I got that man and I loved it. You know, <laughs> and so, you know, so that's kind of what did it for me. But also, this is during the time where, you know, every year there were certain movies that would play on television, right? Because, you know, when I was coming up, you know, in my early years, we didn't have cable. So every year on network TV, you were going to see The Wizard of Oz, Sound of Music. Uh, you were going to see um, King Kong from the 70s. And you're going to see uh, Superman. Yeah. Right? So that was like a big thing. People used to come to our house and stuff, and we would all just kind of sit around and we would watch it. And then somebody would get up and they'd be like, oh, I got to go check on my greens. I'll be right back. And they would come back and we would just sit there and, and watch it. Right. So because it was like a big thing because, you know, we didn't have cable. So um, and just that, like that movie actually did a lot to keep me reading comics so much so because there was still a lot of material coming out like let me see i'm gonna show you this book right here uh oh my Superman god book of superhuman achievements this right here it's a dope book because um and it actually has art in it uh ross andrew drew the um the superman stuff in here and it's it's a beautiful book man and, um, you know, it's just got stuff like this in it. And, and like, there's just like these little like scientific facts and stuff like that. 
that and is so, so cool i didn't yeah. even know that existed yeah yeah it's dope man you can you could probably still still get it like it doesn't i don't think it even costs that much you could get it for like ten dollars probably but as you can see like the cover is kind of falling off of mine but yeah this right here is like what really did it for me and uh there's also a let me see if i can find it uh yeah there's a section in here with um and this is like an intersection of interest right there's a section in here they're talking about the rosetta stone oh and wow. they actually have a you know a section with superman actually like translating meta nature right so yeah this is actually like one of the one of the things where i was like yeah i gotta i gotta like learn how to do that you know and i was that's amazing this. yeah it really is your secret origin <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So yeah, this book came out. Superman and... is the reason you do what you do. <laughs> yeah, That's man. Awesome. Like, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, this book came out in 81. You know, I, I got it for um I think I got it for Christmas one year. You know what I mean? So yeah. So uh yeah, and that that is one of the things that you know set me on the, the trajectory for my life and you know, and it kept me enthusiastic for comics, you know, and so, yeah, yeah, it's, um, hey, it's been a heck of a ride, man, you know? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. When did you, did you find yourself at any point sort of branching away from sort of superhero stuff into uh, other things? Like you mentioned the um, newspaper strips at the start. Was there, was there anything else? Um, yeah, for me, it was like, you know, there wasn't a lot available. So it was like a take what you get kind of thing. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it was like, if I came across something, I would try it, you know, just out of curiosity. But most of the time, you know, it was always, I was getting a lot of my comics secondhand. So a lot of stuff, I didn't even know what it was till I got older because the covers would be missing and stuff yeah. like that. But mm. I enjoyed it because, you know, it was like, it was like lived in and, you know, it's like somebody obviously enjoyed this. Right. So I want to enjoy it, too. So, you know, I wasn't really big on like the condition of the stuff I had. I just was interested in it. Right. And I think that a lot of that actually shaped, you know, the way I enjoy comics today, because, you know, I'm not necessarily concerned about, you know, when I buy a comic, you know, I'm not necessarily like reading it like um, I don't want to put the crease in it, you know, so I have to read it like this, you know, like I'm not like that. You no, know. you enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, you know, and and there's no diss to people that's into that, but you know, I don't really care, and I never really have to be. Honest well, they with enjoy it. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lamar. What was your favorite uh, newspaper strip? My favorite one. You know, I never had a favorite. Well, you know, now that I think about it, because the ones you mentioned mm -hmm. underrated artwork yes underrated very much so. artwork yeah because like yeah. most of the time you see them in newspapers and they're mm -hmm. so small but then sometimes like i'm on you know on facebook i see all of these groups you they show you like a blown up scan of like one panel and i'm mm -hmm. like oh my god these guys can really draw yeah 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 you know and it's I would say it's probably harder to draw that way because, you know, you've got to set certain, you, there's only a few panels that you have and you have to keep the story moving. So like, you know, the people have to come back the next day to get the next four or five panels. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and obviously on the page, your competition is on the page. Right. Right. So, you know, it's not like, you know, it's, it's just, it's just kind of an interesting way of doing things. So it's like, you have to pace things properly. You have to make it where people don't want to read another comic and stop reading yours because that can happen at any given moment. So, uh, yeah, those comics, it was just, you know, and they're all just kind of like black and white, you know, uh, even, uh, you know, so just and that black and white format of comics, I always enjoyed it, you know, and I, I loved like the Sunday comics because there was more stuff and it was all in color. But yeah. Yeah, but yeah, just, you know, those particular art styles like that, like, um, you know, it's it's funny because uh, it was less like cartoonish. And so I guess maybe that's what made it stick out, like in retrospect, you yeah. know, but yeah, those those guys could could really, really draw, man. And um, oh, and I always love the Phantom, too. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the Phantom because yeah. I was a huge fan of the animated series Defenders of the Earth, which yeah, <laughs> yeah I remember that. <laughs> which had a theme song written by Stan Lee and starred Flash Gordon, the Phantom, Mandrake the Magician, and Lothar. You know, um, yeah. and then you had their kids <laughs> in, right. the, in the mm -hmm. cartoon to the mm -hmm. point i have to say that i was always disappointed whenever i read a phantom comic that he did not in fact have the power of 10 tigers <laughs> <laughs> that was the best bit it was like popeye eating a spinach when he called yeah. forth the power of 10 tigers <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, it, there was a lot of that going on. Like even like with Brave Star, you know, he had the access to these different powers from these animals. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was a lot of that going on like back then. Yeah. I also love Brave Star very much. Same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brave Star is dope. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. It was not very, 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 um, ubiquitous seeing a brown-skinned <laughs> protagonist on Saturday morning TV that I'm like, oh, I'm claiming him. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting because, of course, in the UK, um, you know, we, we knew, like, sort of quotation marks, cowboys and Indians, you know, but, like, mm. sort of Native American people we didn't recognize them as such, I suppose, especially as children. Um, so Brave Star, I didn't register him as a person of color, even though he clearly is, like, you know. So that, that's interesting. He's a Native American <laughs> cowboy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because he was adopted by cowboys, but he's a Native American, except he's an alien. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should just talk about Brave Star for the next two hours. <laughs> By the way, his shaman friend being named Shaman probably doesn't age well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they they was out of order for that back then. But yeah. <laughs> Say, wow, we gave up on this. <laughs> God, I love Brave Star. Anyway, Paul. <laughs> that's fantastic thanks very much Lamar that's brilliant Lamar's yeah. secret origin there in, in more ways than one um, so now it's time for my secret origin and my secret origin well basically I should say I was given a bunch of superhero comics by my dad but I was too scared to read them so I was a very sensitive child and you know you flick through these back and, and even like you know it's kind of Silver Age, Bronze Age, Joker, but that even that sort of, that's very scary for me. That's too much for me. So uh, too rich for my blood. So they kind of went unread. <laughs> um, so I wasn't really that into comics until I was bought this, which ah, is yep. the, the Beano number two thousand three hundred and fifty four, which came out on August the twenty ninth, nineteen eighty seven. And it was my pretty much my first ever proper comic, I reckon. And uh, it just started me off with everything, I would say. So I would have been about six years old. And um, I just fell in love with it straight away. So I want to I talk a bit about the Beano. And I'm going to say it with the caveat that um, I'm not a huge expert on British comics mm -hmm. because I've always been more into american comics even though this is what started me off with comics so well i'm just gonna I... go ahead and say paul way to be a stereotype but making the beano your first comic <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah so if i get any of the details wrong here please correct me in the comments please shout me in the comments i know there's lots of people who know a lot more about british comic history than me but um want to talk a little bit about the beano because it's so great uh, it's still going, which is amazing. And it started, the first issue was published in, on the 30th of July, 1938. So about three months after Action Comics number one. And um, it really sort of shaped my sense of humour and it started my love of comics. And it also got me drawing as well. Um, 
me and my friend Maidley, I think you might have encountered online. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah, yeah. We used to make a comic together called The Buffalo. That was basically the veto, <laughs> but with us in it instead. And we we take turns drawing issues of the buffalo, <laughs> which is pretty cool. <laughs> Twenty three years old. No, we were, we were about seven or something, seven or eight. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and it's sort of like the weird thing about the Beano is that it introduced me to like loads of like sort of aspects of being a comic fan, like attaching yourself arbitrarily to a, a comics brand. And just being really passionate about that comics brand, you know, like DC, Marvel, I'm a Superman fan, I'm a Spider-Man fan, whatever. Um, because the Beano had a, a rival comic called The Dandy. And, <sighs> you know, it's, I say rival, they were both made by the same company. Like, by the same <laughs> company. <laughs> but, you know, there was the feeling of like, you're either by the Beano or you buy the Dandy, you know. And um We're cutting into their own cut... profit. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but except Maidley, uh he he uh, he got both of them. He was a very lucky boy. But uh, I could only if uh, I could only get one. I was only allowed to get one, so I chose the Beano. Uh, but you could join clubs and um the cover star of the Beano was Dennis the Menace, who I'll talk about a bit more in a bit. And you had the Dennis the Menace fan club. And this is what you got when you joined the Dennis the Menace fan Oh, my <laughs> God. Which, this isn't the original one I got, because I lost the original one I got, but my friend bought this off eBay and mm -hmm. gave it to me. So this isn't technically my Dennis the Menace fan club official wallet. <laughs> but you got two badges in there. So one with Dennis on, and this is Nasher, his dog. And you can see them there, Dennis and Nasher. I and don't. I don't want to. I don't. I don't mean to preempt you, Paul. But um, as much of our audience is actually from America, I feel like we do have to say this is okay. not American. Dennis the Menace. Okay, so before right. I go yeah, any yeah. further about Dennis mm -hmm. the Menace, I'm going to tell you the difference. So it's not the American Dennis the Menace, but the amazing, and it is amazing. It is amazing. Uh, they both came out on the same day, completely separately of each other. Um, the American blonde-haired Dennis the Menace and the spiky black-haired British Dennis the Menace both um, first were first published on, I've got the date written down here, March the 12th, 1951. They both debuted on the exact same day, purely by coincidence. Isn't that amazing? That mm -hmm. is amazing. <laughs> so... well, but, but, but whereas American Dennis the Menace is really just an annoying little troublemaker, yeah. What uh, is like, British Dennis the Menace? <laughs> okay, so British Dennis the Menace. Uh, uh, before, yeah, I'll go off on a tangent about British Dennis the Menace now. Um, so British Dennis the Menace is essentially a bully, right? <laughs> so he is like <laughs> proper bad, but he's um, but he's the protagonist of of the um, mm -hmm. uh, of his own strip rather than the villain, and. Um, so he gets into mischief like American Dennis the Menace, but but there's proper malice behind his actions. You know? <laughs> and he has a dog called Gnasher, who's um, uh, a fictional breed of dog called an Abyssinian wire-haired tripound. <laughs> and he's just, his thing is that he's this vicious dog that bites everyone. <laughs> and uh, I used to love Dennis the Menace. Like, I used to have a cuddly Dennis the Menace. And like on this cuddly Dennis the Menace's jumper was written, you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. So, so it was just like a bully's taunt written on this children's side. <laughs> I wonder what this says about Brit Britain in 1951. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, so the thing about Dennis the Menace, when I first got into him, is that he always got his comeuppance at the end of the strip. Like he would, there was this, he had like a, uh, an enemy called Walter the Softy, who was essentially this effeminate little boy <laughs> wearing a bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just Dennis would bully Walter mercilessly and get Nasher to bite him on the bum and stuff, you know? <laughs> mm. <laughs> and um, it was horrible, really, uh, but I loved it. And uh, <laughs> but Dennis would always get his comeuppance. Uh, he would usually end up getting the slipper, 
which would mean he uh... would get spanked with a slipper by his father, or he might get spanked by his grandmother, who had a really hard old slipper called the Demon Whacker. <laughs> and he particularly dreaded the Demon Whacker, you know. <laughs> Different times. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is it. I, but it, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, as attitudes changes, and they were changing while I was getting into Dennis the Menace, he would still get the slipper. But, you know, less and less often as I went on reading the Beano. And when you take away the slipper, which I must stress was the right thing to do, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I am by no means saying that Dennis the Menace should still be getting the slipper in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> but if you take away the slipper, you, you take away that, the ending of your story, the comeuppance, right? So you've either got to make Dennis less bad or you've got to come up with some other way for him to get his comeuppance, which is, uh, you know, and so I feel like as I was reading Dennis the Menace, and this is only in retrospect, I realised this, you could see these attitudes change and you could see the style of the story change in that Dennis became less bad, you know, and wow. his antics would get more ridiculous, you know. That's interesting. And yeah, and because he didn't have this comeuppance waiting for him at the end of the story anymore. So, um, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing or anything like that, you know, I, I, but I, there is part of me that kind of misses the really bad Dennis that he used to get. <laughs> I get it. But, I get um, it. It's interesting. Yeah. But you can even see it in this story, which is, is the first ever um, story Dennis the Men's story I read. Uh, and um, in this story, his hair has gotten too long. So he washes it with starch and then goes around um, poking people on the backside <laughs> with his pointy <laughs> sharp hair. <laughs> and you can see him there poking Walter the Softy on the bum. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's a little shit, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> so he was I feel uh, I'm sure he was still getting the slipper at this point in stories generally but at the end of this story his dad gets his hair shaved off and he has to use Gnasha as a wig until his hair <laughs> grows back so I wonder if this I, I mean I don't know but I wonder if this was maybe the start of them you know kind of phasing in these more kind of you know, silly for want of a better word, punishments, comeuppances for him to get hmm. rather than uh, rather than the slipper. Hey, what's the um, what's the date on that one? The one you just held up? Oh yeah, th this is the first one I I bought. Uh, 29th uh -huh. of August, nineteen eighty seven. Eighty seven. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. And the so, Beano is still uh, going, right? It's the still Beano's going. still going. And as far as I know, Dennis the Man is is, is still the cover star. Um, but I. But I might be wrong there because I haven't read it for like years and years and years, mm -hmm. uh, which is right, I think, because I'm I'm not the audience. It should be very much for eight year olds in 2024, you know? I mean, but, no, so I think that is the men who should grow old with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. the, Absolutely. the next generation should get new characters. <laughs> Funny enough, now that you mention it, though, they did do this thing where they changed Dennis's dad. So I don't know if you can see on the screen here, but Dennis's dad in the 80s was this sort of balding guy with like a Hitler mustache. And um, he he was always Dennis's dad for all I knew. But recently, mm -hmm. they, in the past 10, 20 years or so, they've changed Dennis's dad to sort of like an older version of Dennis with spiky black hair, <laughs> with the implication that he's the original Dennis from when I used to read it. And there is a new Dennis the Bear. <laughs> I mean, he's the same character, you know, but they kind of imply that this is now Dennis's dad, the one I used to read, which is a bit weird. Well, now, <laughs> see, I told you, Dennis the Menace grew old with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the the current Dennis the Menace is essentially still Dennis the Menace. He's got Ganasha, he's got the same stripy top and all that. You know, they haven't changed him that much. Mm -hmm. Um. So, yeah, you've got these badges with Dennis Ignatia. And um, if you join the Dennis the Menace fan club, 
I can't you believe you ha- you you joined the Dennis the Menace fan club. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, this isn't mine. I lost mine. This card belonged to someone called Matthew King. So if you're out there, Matthew, I've got your membership card. Um, presumably Matthew sold this on eBay and my friend put it off him. Um, but it's got code words. So when you meet another member of the Dennis the Menace fan club, you're supposed to say ding. And then that stands for Dennis is never good. And then <laughs> they reply with dong, which, uh, which uh, stands for Dennis owns naughty nasher. So it's like a sort of code word. But yeah, so there we go. I suppose I shouldn't be saying this. It's secret. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I wanted to show you these is because the dandy bear cover star was really weird. I don't think he's still a cover star. He was good, but he was weird. He was a cowboy called Desperate Dan, who was super strong, like absurdly strong. And that was his thing. Like Popeye? And he- yeah, yeah, he was basically Popeye. And mm. and what he would do, he would eat um, cow, cow pies, which were pies made out of whole cows. And like it would just be a huge pie with the cow's horns coming out the top of the crust and like a tail hanging over the edge. <laughs> uh, it was very strange. So the equivalent in the dandy of the Dennis the Menace fan club in the 80s was the Desperate Dan Pie Eaters Club. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Which is really strange. <laughs> but it was a similar thing, you know, you got like a little, uh, mm-hmm. you can see like a cow pie on the badge there with the horns. And there's like a badge of Dan. And then you had similar like code, uh, code words and stuff. But I was never a member of this, so I shouldn't really have this. Because I was <laughs> never a <official laughs> exactly. member of the party club. His, his name is Desperate Dan? Yeah. Okay, I'm looking at him now. Interesting. Can I go off on a little bit of a tangent? Because yeah, I please just, do. Yeah, this book. I just read Basil Wolverton's. I just read Basil Wolverton's Powerhouse Pepper. Oh wow! Which is a, a cowboy who is also super strong, like Popeye. Oh my. <laughs> and he really likes milk from cows specifically. Yeah. Like, was this just a thing? <laughs> like, yeah, I guess it was like a, a trope, I suppose. The super strong cowboy, maybe. I don't know. Well, no, tell me this, Paul. Like, why? Why is one of the UK's most, you know, landmark characters a cowboy? I have absolutely no idea. Like, he wasn't the original cover star, uh, Desperate Dan. The original cover star was Corky the Cat, who is, quite frankly, crap. I hate Corky. (laughs) (laughs) Never never found Corky the Cat funny. And possibly for that reason, he was replaced at some point. I'm not sure when. I don't know as much about Dan as I do about Dennis, because I'm a Beano guy, you know? Yeah, of course. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But at some point, Dan replaced Corky as the cover star. And, um, yeah, uh, and, but I don't know why. And he lived in, like, Cactusville, so he was a proper uh, cowboy. He didn't live in Dandy Town or Dandyville or whatever it was called, where, it was, where all the other dandy characters lived. He lived in his own town in America called Cactusville. <laughs> why? I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, maybe he was a ripoff of Powerhouse Pepper. I don't know. No, it looks like he... Did you know that in 2011 he was voted as the UK's second favorite superhero behind Batman? Who, Desperate Dan? Yeah. Wow, fair play. Wow. <laughs> like, wh- wh- what? What? <laughs> as far as I know, the dandy's not going anymore. The Beano is, but the dandy finished. Did you know but, that there is um, a statue of Desperate Dan in Dundee, Scotland? Yes, I did know that because that's where the Beano and Dandy were made in Dundee. Yeah. So... <laughs> My mind is blown. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, I, f- I should have researched Desperate Dan more now. <laughs> 
but I think what people will want to know, Paul, is like, so after that, when did you get into American comics, specifically Superman? Well, after this, I started reading uh, my dad's comics, what he had, dad's American comics, like Batman, um, Aquaman. He had um, he had a Spider-Man as well. He had the one where Spider-Man fights Electro in the TV studio. Do you remember that one? I think that's like, the first appearance of Bagman. I think that's when he first takes his Spider-Man uh, costume yeah. and puts a bag on his head. <laughs> 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 so um that kind of got me uh into american superheroes then uh but i was still quite scared of them and the first american comic well it wasn't an american comic it was a british reprint of american comics it was a batman comic and it was issue one of batman monthly and um it reprinted i'll show you what it reprinted the first two issues of the untold legend of batman oh. which is pretty but awesome the lost um, batman origin yeah yeah so i i have the american copies of this now i don't still have the the british version i had but yeah i never read the, i never got issue two so i didn't read the third part of the untold legend of batman or until i was an adult basically but yeah i was just enraptured in the story of batman <laughs> and um it was just but i was still scared so at the end of issue two, which would have been at the end of this first issue of Batman Monthly, he starts talking about his villains and Joker and Two-Face turn up. And I was still scared of them. So I taped the pages with Joker and Two-Face on together so I wouldn't accidentally see them while I was reading the comic. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, Paul. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just loved superheroes after that. And um I started uh I, I, I would get annuals, like hardback annuals, British reprints of Spider-Man comics from like church fates and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, a bit like uh, what Lamar was talking about when he found the Golden Age comics. You know, I'd find these hardback reprints of Spider-Man comics. And uh, one of them was the night Gwen Stacy died. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is a really intense first Spider-Man story. It was one of my first Spider-Man stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, um, and then when I was about 10, my friend lent me Man of Steel. John mm. Burns, Man of Steel, and the rest is history. I just absolutely loved it. <laughs> See, you were talking about Man of Steel earlier and how Byrne was, um, the way he writes is stuff that kids are concerned with, right? Yeah. Like, that didn't really apply to me. I was four. Oh, like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, I think, this is a weird thing. I don't know when I realized that the pictures told a story so much as <laughs> these are a set of pictures that look cool. Like, I don't know when I realized that because I think at first I was just looking through comics and being like, oh my mm. God, these are pictures that look cool. And then eventually I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> these go in order. Yeah, yeah. They're sequential. Yeah, sequential. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like when I first read like Man of Steel, I you know 10 11 years old it's you know that's the age where you're like oh yeah well superman's invulnerable because he's got an invisible aura that's one inch away from his skin and that's why his costume doesn't tear and you find all that kind of stuff really interesting when you're 10 or 11 don't you I think, well when you're a certain kind of little boy i think you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you find that interesting and i think i was that kind of little boy and i think John Byrne is that kind of little boy as well. <laughs> you think he still is? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think he is that kind of little boy when he's writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's not that kind of little boy when he's reading. Yes, I think you might be right there, yeah. <laughs> John Byrne is never doing an interview with us. <laughs> <laughs> I never really counted on it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry so, yeah. john yeah, sorry john sorry john you're still great <laughs> yeah Yo, you, yeah 
<laughs> so, he got me into Superman, so you can't fault him for that, really, can you? You know. <laughs> got, did he get you into the Fantastic Four too? Uh, no, no. Oh, I tell you what, got me into the Fantastic Four. I my at my grandparents' house was one of my dad's old annuals from the 60s and again it was a hardback reprint of american stuff and it was a hardback reprint of kirby fantastic four oh and wow do you know the issue where they play that baseball game with the black panther well there's a stan and jack issue of fantastic four with the ff player a, a baseball yeah. game mm -hmm. with um black panther and it's awesome <laughs> uh, and that was one of the stories and i think um from there Johnny went off with Wyatt Wingfoot in a big ball to, <laughs> to, to find the Inhumans because he was so obsessed with Crystal, but yeah. he couldn't get the humans because of the barrier. And I just loved it. It was so great, you know. But the, you know, back then you couldn't get any more. It was just whatever was in the news agent because I didn't know comic shops existed, you know. Mm. So it was just whatever was on the news agent shelf. So, you know, they did reprints of Batman. They did reprints of Superman. They had a, a reprint comic called Heroes, which reprinted like Brave and the Bold and stuff like that, that my friend used to get. And Blue Devil, weirdly, that reprinted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so, you know, you could just get bits and bobs where you could. So it wasn't like I could immediately go out and find more Fantastic Four. But they mm -hmm. did have the cartoons on at the time. They had the old Hanna-Barbera one. With, with the Herbie? Awesome no, no. Um, the, oh, the original. Oh, the one Barbara from the one. 60s. Yeah. The one from the 60s. They used to show that on a Saturday morning on Channel 4. Uh, the one where Galactus is green. Yes, that's the yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, funny story about that. I, when the Josh, is it Josh Trank who made the Fantastic Four film Nobody Likes? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So when that came out, that was coming out, I edited together a trailer for it along with the theme tune from the Hanna-Barbera and it, and it synced it all up with the sound effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and Josh Trank shared it. And I think he got on like, ain't it cool news and stuff like, yeah, uh, um, mm -hmm. which was brilliant. But then of course the film turned out to be what it was. <laughs> well, that's all right. Cause you probably exposed a lot of people to that theme song. Cause that theme song is nuts. That theme song yeah, yeah, is yeah, 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 It's yeah, so yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but yeah i used to like um i used to watch the herbie cartoon as well and that used to be on and we never got super friends you never got super friends really never got, i didn't know super friends existed which i i would have loved super friends i would have been the audience for super friends but we never got it it was a real shame i don't know why so that's sad <laughs> we we eventually got um spider-man and the amazing friends that was a pretty big yeah we, we got that mm -hmm. yeah we did have spider-man and his amazing friends and yeah. the theme tune to that is also a banger as well yes it is yes it is and you know what's <laughs> funny is when i read spider-man's dialogue in my head the voice actor from no. that show that's who i hear yeah yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. really yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um I like that, but I preferred the other Spider-Man cartoon that was coming out at the time, the solo one. Yeah, that was oh, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that mm -hmm. had a great theme tune as well. Yeah. That's the one where he mm -hmm. shrinks in the opening credits and yeah. then yeah. goes again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what, was a, what were other um, pivotal comics for you guys? Because mine was... So here's the thing, right? I got into comics because of DC. Mm -hmm. But... But... DC was not cool in school. Wow. Right. Everyone was into Marvel, especially starting in the, like 1990 because of the Mar because of the Marvel trading cards. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was like such a big thing. Everybody was like, oh yeah. And then you'd say you're, you were to DC and they were like, no, like Marvel's cooler. So my favorite superhero at the time was the Flash, just because he could run really fast. And I asked my brother, who is the Flash's counterpart in Marvel Comics? And thankfully, he didn't say Quicksilver. 
because he actually took the question literally and said, who is the fastest character in Marvel Comics? And the answer is the Silver Surfer. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go buy some Silver Surfer comics. I walk into mm -hmm. the store, and what do I see but Infinity Gauntlet number three? Mm -hmm. The one where, like, everyone's coming at you and Silver Surfer's right there on top. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then um, also right beside it, Infinity Gauntlet number four. Oh, wow. So I asked my dad to buy them both. So that's the one where Thanos is just like, come and get me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was also, I bought the Silver Surfer comic. It was number 51. It was Ron Mars's first issue. Uh, Ron mm -hmm. Lim was drawing it. So that was an Infinity Gauntlet crossover where um, Nova finds a planet for Galactus. Mm -hmm. But it's inhabited and she remembers the time that the Silver Surfer took her back through time to see france prehistoric france and then basically it was a whole thing about how if galactus had destroyed this then then you would have never been able to visit this when you were a teenager um you know and to a nine-year-old kid that sounded like the deepest conversation in the world <laughs> like uh so i had the infinity gauntlet so you know george paris basically got me into both universes i guess and then i started collecting from there really i started buying everything from there mm -hmm. that's cool it's funny you mentioned the flash there because i think my love of the flash started with this as well the v -Nex. how how because <laughs> there's a character there's a beano character called billy whiz i mean he's that just sounds like he's gonna pee yeah <laughs> he's actually the fastest boy alive. And uh, he's got a weird haircut. I don't know if you can see, but Billy Wiz's trademark haircut, he's he's all shaved uh, over his head, except for like two strands of hair at the front that poke up like antennae. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> but specifically, look at this panel here. So um, Billy wants to reply to his pen pal, right? He's got a pen pal in... Um, where is his pen pal? Um... Africa, so somewhere in Africa, I don't think it says. But um, Billy, rather than just reply to the letter, can you see that? He runs across the air. So runs across the ocean, across the land. He runs to somewhere in Africa and visits his friend rather than reply to the letter, which is that that's the flash, right? That's, you know, <laughs> just running across the world in minutes. Is, is that his friend down in, in the bottom corner with the huge afro? Yes, <laughs> it's it's actually really bad now that I look at it. Um, because his friend lives in Africa. It doesn't say we're in Africa, but you got elephants, an elephant, a monkey, and a giraffe. And oh, this is I'm kind of embarrassed by this. <laughs> um, his pen pal's house is is kind of made out of straw or something. <laughs> I I mean, I, how how do exactly. you know that's not accurate? <laughs> Now, do it. Keep in mind, you asked for this, right? Because you said <laughs> how. So this is you. This is on you today, okay? How do you know that's not accurate, Paul? Uh, uh, yeah. Were you in Africa in 1987? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. Uh, okay, so if I, was, I were to go by 1987 comics, the Philippines doesn't even exist. <laughs> can i show you another thing that hasn't aged well <laughs> there's this character so karate kid obviously big film in the 80s so we've got a character here called karate sid who uh, no it's not, yes. <laughs> so it's not clear if karate sid is like a white boy who really likes karate or if he actually is you know asian yo but, He's got no. a pet dragon. Instead of a boy, he's got a pet wow. instead of a dog, he's got a pet dragon. And uh, oh god. And his <laughs> oh my god, this is awful. His his dragon's little sort of kennel is filled with like takeaway Chinese takeaway It's terrible. It's really bad. 
<laughs> but your original question was about pivotal comics, wasn't it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what were your other pivotal comics? Like so, the thing um, that you, now you're addicted because, like, you know, who's who, all that stuff, crisis got me like into, into comics, but it was yeah. Infinity Gauntlet that got me buying comics. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was uh, the Batman Monthly. I didn't start getting it straight away, but I did start getting it like um, a year or two later. And by that point, they'd gone for the, they'd started reprinting the later stuff rather than the early 80s stuff. They were printing more recent stuff. So we were getting the Grant Brayfogel Batman, which, uh, and that was huge for me. That was, that's, um, you know, all, all those stories like, uh, you know, Night People with the Corrosive Man mm -hmm. and the Fear with Cornelius Sturk. And so, you know, I'd gone from being a bit scared of Jim Aparo drawing the Joker and Two-Face to now like mm -hmm. Norm Brayfogel drawing Cornelius Sturk. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was kind of only you'd been... exposing myself, you know, to more if... and more of it. <laughs> if only you'd been into Kelly Jones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That would have been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but then, like, um, you know, you, Nightfall happened. And, and I loved Nightfall at the time. And um, the death of Superman, I loved that at the time. But, like, after Nightfall, I kind of went off Batman and, by extension, sort of superhero comics a little bit. And it didn't help that around that time, I was, like, a, a teenager by this point. And I was, like, just, just as sometimes teenagers are, just not a very nice person you know around that time so there's a couple of years where i was uh, like a real shit you know obviously starching my hair poking people on the buttocks with my <laughs> 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 that kind of thing you know <laughs> but um in around like 97 i picked up jla new world order the first uh... collection of morrison's friend. And, I, and I've never looked back since then. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's just that got me right back in. Right. And um, yeah, and I've never been out since. So Grant Morrison, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In in uh, ninety eight, I was collecting two comics. Like I was like, ah, most of these are not good. Or, you know, I spent my money on them. And but Morrison's and Porter's JLA and Busick. And Perez's Avengers. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I love these so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lamar, any more pivotal comics for you? Um, yeah, going back to what I was telling y'all about how I used to get my comics at the at the yard sales and stuff like that. Uh, you know, in in uh the flash 80 page giant number nine they reprinted the flash of two worlds oh. and i got that from one of the um i got that from a flea market and it's dope because it's like it doesn't have the classic cover but it has like this block it's like a black block in the middle and it has you know the flash of two worlds and then jay garrick's on one side and barry's on the other and then you know it's one of the stories that they I think it's the first reprint of that story, but I had, but I had that and that story right there, you know, I say it all the time. That's one of the greatest stories written in the English language. As far as I'm concerned, it's, you know, it's just an amazing story and, you know, and it actually, you know, cause y'all know, I love the JSA and, you know, when Jay Garrick shows up, when I saw Jay Garrick on the cover, I was like, I'm getting this. Like, there's no way I ain't getting this. And so that one was the one that did it. That was the first time I actually had read um, a Flash story from that period. And I was just, I couldn't stop reading that story, you know. Uh, so that was like one for me. And, and you know, like when I got a little older, like when I, you know, in my college days, I was... I was in and out of comics because like after the speculation boom and everything, I kind of got out of it. Yeah, you know, because nothing really appealed to me, so I just stopped. But um, like, it was harder to find things that appealed to you because you just because there was like so much. It was out, a lot. Right? Yeah, yeah, and and in a lot of ways, it was mismanaged stuff. Like yeah. 
you know, it's it's a little different today where like whatever you're into, there's probably a comic about it now. Right. It's easier and, to find it, too. And it's easier to get stuff, you know. But like back then, you know, it was a little harder, you know, because a lot of the times if you wanted something off the beaten path like that, you had to actually contact the person who was making it because they probably right. were going broke financing it themselves. Right. Unless you went to a convention or something like that. And we didn't have a lot of that where I was, you know, so, um, you know, so it was a little dry. So I just kind of, you know, would go to the comic shop and I would just get back issues and and I would try new stuff that like I hadn't read before that came out like 10 years before that. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I was doing a lot of that. And. But then, you know, the same thing with with Pauly, I read that it was it was the um, what was it? It was the Justice League, the um, Morrison. Was it? Yeah, it was the Morrison joint. It was the Midsummer Night's. Um, the one before that, a Midsummer's Nightmare. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the one by that Wade. One. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It was That's that one. so good. That's a good Might story, say, yeah. and it's underrated too. Like yeah. you know, yeah. When people talk about stories from that period, it hardly ever comes up. But yeah, so I was like, okay, this is this is you know this is it. So let me see what the other stuff is, and then that's when I got into um, the the JLA stuff. Um, and it was the same thing. I bought the New World Order collection. And I I wasn't that far behind, you know, so I just immediately caught up. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this is this is nuts. And I was like, this is Grant Morrison. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me go ahead and, and, and get this. And, you know, because Kyle was like the new kid on the block. But Wally was the new kid on the block in a sense, but not really because he's been a superhero all his life. And they're so the I same really, age. And they're the same age. Yeah. So I really like that dynamic. You know, it was great. Same. You know, yeah. And and just the new things that he was doing. Um, and then, you know, after that, you get into uh uh the other stuff where they expanded the league and stuff like that. And then uh was didn't Mark Wade have his run after that? Yeah, Tower of Babel and all Yeah, yeah, all of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, yeah, this is you know, this is this is the stuff that like I was missing all those years ago when I got out. It was this kind of stuff, you know, and. Um, you know, because the Justice League in particular was in a bad state then. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Um, well, you know, I'll, but uh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something is um, I got into that JLA run on issue five, mm -hmm. like the first four issues, like completely flew over my head. And I got into it issue five because Plastic Man was on the cover. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. And I was like, the hell is Plastic Man doing it? Because, like, I know Plastic Man from freaking Plastic Man Hour with Plastic Baby. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is Plastic Man doing on the cover of JLA? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Morrison and Porter, the way they, the way they did the whole thing. It was just such a good. You know what was great about that run? It's just it never stopped. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It just like, all right, here are two issues where they fight angels, and then mm -hmm. now they're fighting the key. <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was great. It was great. Yeah, it was like great. it was just nonstop creativity. Funny you mentioned Plastic Man because it made me think about you know there's a DC superpowers. Uh, episode where at the end of the episode there's the, the computer at the Hall of Justice was malfunctioning and they found out it was a mouse crawling around and they thought it was like some big security breach and it was a mouse crawling around in the computer so Plastic Man had to use his powers to go in there to reach in there and get it and Superman was telling him where to go with his x-ray vision you know so when you brought up the Plastic Man cartoon it just made me think about that yeah. but uh yeah uh so and it's funny too because there was a there was something that I read and I got it secondhand. I think it was like a collection of like Plastic Man stuff. I think, and it had the issue in it with the little boy with the big eyes. Oh right? yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know yeah, what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, and um, yeah, the book is uh, Plastic Man Forms Stretch to Their Limits by Art Spiegelman and Chip Kid, and then. It, uh, mm -mm, it not that one. 
Not that not one. Not that one. Yeah, I got that too, but not that one. Oh, okay. It was, it was it was like way before that, and I can't remember what it was. The um, boy with the plastic have... eyes and the guy with the. Yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah. That was the uh -huh. villain. Yeah, yeah. That Cole was, was weird. Okay. He was a weird dude. Yeah, because because you you find out you know that the guy he was basically running a like a kidnapping ring and he was abusing these children and all of this other kind of stuff. But the thing that stuck out to me was that uh, he was plastic man was chasing the dudes at the gas station and he corners them and he takes the gas pump off of the, the thing and sticks it in the dude's mouth and pulls the trigger. So it's like, you know, he killed this dude, right? <laughs> it's like, there's no way this guy survived that. You know, so it's just, you know, stuff like that. You know, I just was like, man, I had I did I had no idea, man. You know, <laughs> so I remember having that that mind blown moment, you know, like the like the um the gif with the dude and the fireworks are going off, you know. So like <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that probably happened that happened when I was like maybe eleven or twelve. You know what I mean? So awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, and that actually led me to read more stuff from that period and so really you know, yeah yeah uh, but there's I'm, nothing yeah. like plastic man though from yeah that yeah era. yeah like even even like during that time there was a lot of stuff going on you know in in the comics there was a like a lot of creativity going on back then but he was he was still able to stand out as a character like it's it's crazy no there was a lot of creativity but like jack cole was just weird mm, yeah 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 <laughs> it was just yeah. weird he was a weird dude yeah yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> he was definitely a weird guy. And, um, you know, yeah, and I highly recommend that book, Form Stretch to the Limits, that Dewey was talking about. Yeah, it definitely get that book. It's it's excellent. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. I love how like, we're all Flash fans, by the way. Yeah. Oh, no question. No question. <laughs> but I also yeah. feel like all three of us have a different favorite Flash. That's true. So yours is Wally, isn't Mine it? Mine is Jay? Wally. Mine's Barry. Is yours Jay then, Lamar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. But you, you know what though? Between the three of them, it's like a very, very slim margin. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like as far as like, you know. And I think for me, what does it for for Jay is just his attitude and the way he approaches things, and and um and also like his costume, but. That's it. But it's like a, it's like, they're like this. So it's not like I got him up here and, you know, Barry's down here and Wally's down here. They're all kind of mm. right there together for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's interesting to me because for me, the best of Wally is better than the best of the other two. But mm -hmm. the worst of Wally is so much worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> than the worst of the other two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And for everyone who wonders what I mean, just read Wolfman and Perez's New Teen Titans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I always say that, you know, Wally West, he would, uh, that, that version of Wally West, he would be voting Trump, you know? <laughs> he would! Oh, no question. No question. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He would. Yeah. He's like... You know, I think he actually says a line that's something like, I don't judge you guys for being liberals. Why do you judge me for being a conservative? Just <laughs> as he is discriminating against a Russian dude. <laughs> I'm so glad they dropped that. I, I, I can see what Wolfman was trying to do. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it didn't quite work. Yeah, he didn't stick the landing on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I like the Flash in general. I told you when I said that, um, when I asked my brother who the Flash's counterpart was, my favorite Flash at the time was actually Barry Allen mm -hmm. for the simple reason that at the time, Wally West could only run at the speed of sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is a tip to any writer. Just don't do that to the flash. Okay. Yeah. It's the speed yeah. of light or bust. Yeah. yeah. There's no I mean, point otherwise. That that's why I love Barry so much. Is uh because uh, 
part of my secret origin is that after I got really into Batman, do you remember they did those, you know, the greatest Batman stories ever told, the greatest Superman stories yeah. ever told, mm -hmm. the greatest team up stories. And the greatest team up stories ever told had the flash of two worlds in it, mm. which ah. you know, is fantastic. It also had the jungle line, Superman and Swamp thing, Alan Moore in it. Yeah. yeah. That's a good so, story. Yeah. Really good collection. Mm -hmm. And um and then I'm not sure that's a Superman story I would recommend to a child. No, and like I, I, I'm gonna be honest, yeah. it was one that I appreciated more as I got older. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they did the greatest flash stories ever told then. And um and that's where I really I, like my dad had some old issues with Barry and old flash issues with Barry and that I loved, but the greatest flash story ever, flash stories ever told. That's where I really fell in love with Barry. And just this idea of using science like magic mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, just the imagination going, it's like Quicksilver just runs fast, right? Yeah. But Barry, that's just the start of it, that he runs fast. You know, he he uses that then to do so many more weird and wonderful things. And it's all got this sort of cod science explanation as well, which yeah. I absolutely, you know. It's like how Reed Richards, you know, the stretching is secondary. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, just like Barry is just a clever, imaginative dude. <laughs> and that's what I just really loved about him. And not, not, it's, yeah. it's like Reed. It's not just the academic smarts it's the imagination to use mm -hmm. that as well um yeah i love barry flashbacks. <laughs> so, yeah flashbacks yeah, yeah, yeah. that sums it up flashbacks mm -hmm. and of course the best moment of jla new world order and you can imagine how i felt about this where wally gives a flashback <laughs> while running around the world to punch someone in the face <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, like, so Yale New World Order, I bought that trade paperback. So we all have the same trade paperback, which is this tiny. Mm, I yeah. brought that to school, right? I brought that to school, and this one dude that I never even really spoke to was just reading it. And he's just reading it, reading it, reading it. And then all of a sudden, I hear him go, Oh my God, what a punch! <laughs> and I knew exactly what he was reading. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I love that moment. Yeah. Using science as magic, man. That's that's you know DC comics in a way, isn't it? Like you know, mm -hmm. it's, I love it. I, I just want to say a little bit more about Rubino because I love it. Is that all right? <laughs> Can I say we go again? Go I ahead. <laughs> so I love these guys, the Bash Street kids. And um, the Bash Street kids are like basically 10 Dennis, a class full of like nine or 10 Dennis the Menaces, basically. Just a, a class of naughty kids. But, you know, they've all got, and again, you can see this, my love of superheroes here, because they've all got some defining characteristic, mm -hmm. like this one called Spotty, who's Spotty. <laughs> this, this one called Fatty. <laughs> oh my goodness. Who is, who is fat. And there's one called Smithy, who is uh, just, his thing is that he's very stupid. So, for example, the in this strip, the first Battery Kids strip I ever read, um, the teacher has asked the kids to paint their parents. And Smithy actually brings in his parents into the classroom and he's coloured his parents in. He's literally painted his parents, you see. <laughs> so, <laughs> because he's not very bright. Amazing. But probably my favorite is uh Plug. And I I honestly don't know whether they're still doing battery kids in the same way, whether they're still doing like fatty and plug in the same way. Because Plug's thing is that he's intensely ugly. <laughs> and to the, like to people can't bear to look at him, and that's kind of like his power is that he is so ugly. <laughs> Wow, I I yeah. don't know. Um, so in Archie comics, there's a character named Big Ethel. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, who mm -hmm. her whole thing is that she's the ugly girl, right? So she's traditionally drawn like too tall, lanky, buck teeth, all that. And I've noticed that in reprints, they they've remastered it so that she no longer has the buck teeth. Oh wow, that's interesting. I wonder what they've done with Plug. Uh, yeah, if mm -hmm. anyone knows what's what's up with Plug at the moment, say in the cough. 
<laughs> but the reason I bring up the Bashley kids is because um, at this time it was drawn by David Sutherland, who was the guy who was at that point drawing Dennis the Menace as well. Mm -hmm. But they were created by a guy called Leo Baxendale. And um, the reason I bring him up, because my favourite Beano strip of all time was this Calamity James, who's the unluckiest boy in the world. And uh, it is just about this boy going around just having a really bad time. <laughs> yes. and he doesn't have a dog. He's got a pet lemming. You know, the implication being that, you know, lemmings at the time were famous for being suicidal. You know? <laughs> and it is, his pet lemming's called Alexander Lemming. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, James walks around and he's got this black cloud always following him around above his uh, head. But, the, you know, it's... It's, written, it's drawn by a guy called Tom Patterson. And obviously I didn't know the name of any of these artists at the time, but I immediately sort of recognized that like, I love this art style, even yeah. at the age of mm -hmm. like seven or eight or whatever, I, I love this art style. And like, you know, I, you can't really see it, but in every single panel, there's something going on. Like there's that black cloud following him around. There's like bags of money and gold bars that like James is oblivious to and just walks past because he doesn't realize there's like these little characters called little squelchy thingies like little monsters going around in the background in the first panel there's just a set of false teeth on the pavement for no reason <laughs> yes <laughs> but what I didn't realize is that um what Tom Patterson was doing at the time there he was really influenced by Leo Baxendale who created the Bash Street Kids and if you go back and look at Leo Baxendale's work, everything I loved about Tom Patterson's work at the time, and I should say that Tom Patterson is an amazing artist in his own right and has developed and everything, but everything I loved about the Calamity James strips was Leo Baxendale's work. So it's interesting in retrospect, you know, I've sort of gone back and, and found like, you know, collections of Leo Baxendale's work. You can see this is Sweeney Toddler. My goodness. Um, Yes, this is a great thing to show children. <laughs> yeah, so Sweetie Toddler, who's just this baby with a like a single fang <laughs> in, in his mouth, and as you can see, like Sweeney Toddler's got like a five o'clock shadow spell, <laughs> even though he's baby. Hey man, what? And, and you know that that kind of humor, you know the, these grotesque, lumpy characters. That's what I loved about Tom Patterson's work. And, and but that's all from Leo Baxendale. So really, I guess I just wanted to do a little shout out to Leo Baxendale and uh, Calamity James because they, more than any other artist, I think, just really shape my humor and just just what I love in this kind of comic. Like so, yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Hey, if you're if you're in the audience, let us know what your uh, secret origin for comics is. Absolutely, we would, like to, we would like to hear how you got into yeah. the medium, into superheroes, into into whatever, into whatever you're reading. Yeah, absolutely. What's your first comic? When did you first read Crisis on Infinite Earths? <laughs> <laughs> My God, I still have those issues, man, and wow. I will never, ever, ever read them again because I have the absolute edition. <laughs> uh, i'm reading the absolute edition i'm not reading this crappy newsprint where like i can't even read the monitor tapes <laughs> you know, or, or like any time the monitor talks in like those early issues because it's like white text on like on, on black ink and it just yeah. doesn't print well <laughs> oh, what made people think this was a good idea <laughs> by the way can i go off on a quick tangent about crisis on infinite earths Absolutely. Because, like, Crisis on Infinite Earths, with the exception of JLA Avengers, is my f absolute favorite um, comic uh, superhero event. Mm -hmm. And I honestly believe that so much of what I love about it is, is by any objective measure, bad writing. Because, let's just start this off with this. At the start of Crisis on Infinite, of Infinite Earths, the monitor comes up with a team that he just says is the most logical team to face the anti-monitor. And it is a team that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> right? It and they makes... don't actually 
anything. <laughs> it makes no sense. They achieve nothing. They lose. They <laughs> right. Like we got the older Superman. Why not? Why did it like? And then Harbinger even addresses it. She's like, "Why didn't we get the younger, more powerful one?" And <laughs> Monitors is like, "I know what I'm doing. Trust me. Clearly, you don't because three issues in, you died." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you know, Crisis on Infinite Earth has like eight endings. Like every time <laughs> you think it's gonna end, it doesn't end yet. And then. <laughs> Crisis on Infinite Earths number seven starts with um, a meeting somewhere in outer space of of um, Harbinger Pariah and the greatest heroes of five Earths: Superman, Superman, Captain Marvel, Lady Quark, and the Blue Beetle. <laughs> 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 so like just so much of and like there is no there's no focal point of the story at all right <laughs> like it's not like these other events were like oh yeah okay so infinite crisis is really a superman story like obviously mm -hmm. um yeah. uh even doomsday clock for all for everything that happens to it is clearly about superman um mm. was yeah war of the realms is about thor uh, the Infinity Gauntlet is really about Thanos, you know, mm. stuff like that. But Crisis on Infinite Earths, who is it about? <laughs> it's a uh, it, it's a Costanza comic, isn't it? It's about nothing <laughs> <laughs> and everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but see, that's what I love about it because it's so freaking chaotic. <laughs> and it's just got everyone. Issue 12 opens with Dolphin and Animal Man. <laughs> Dolphin, yeah, Animal yeah. Man, and Rip Hunter out in space looking at Brainiac's corpse. What? <laughs> like, <laughs> this makes no sense. And I love it yeah. so much. The uh, logical team is one of my favorite bits. Like, you know, we're going up against the Anti-Monitor you know, a god from the antimatter universe who is literally eating universes. Thank God we've got Firebrand on our team. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we've got the aging king of Gorilla City on our team. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we don't have any Green Lanterns. Oh, yeah. wait, we do. Don't... No, we have was no Green Lanterns. Stewart? No, we have John Stewart on. Somehow yeah, we don't yeah. have... We don't have the more powerful Superman. Yeah. We don't have a single Captain Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> Batman <laughs> does nothing for the entirety of these 12 issues. <laughs> like, absolutely nothing. Like, I have a friend who uh, was watching the Crisis on Infinite Earths animated movie, and he's oh, such yeah. a huge Batman fan, and he was just complaining to me, and he was like, you know, Batman makes no sense in this. Like, they give him you know uh they give him shit to do blah 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 and i'm like he does nothing in the comic either so i don't know what you're complaining yeah. about yeah he uh he sees the flash die a couple of times for no reason <laughs> but yeah as much as i do make fun of it because i do think like so much of what i love about it is bad writing um so much of what i do also love about it is like some of the best writing ever which is you know when supergirl dies when flash dies like yeah, that's yeah. Th those things those are amazing yeah. why the specter takes 10 issues to show up <laughs> <laughs> kind of feels like he could have shown up earlier but okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's great we it's should do great. a whole process I, th I think we've basically done a crisis episode here haven't we <laughs> like, you know what let's do crisis yeah, <laughs> let's do crisis next time. How, how about it? Yeah, I'm I'm hip. Yeah, let us know in the comments. Yeah. Should we do crisis? Should we do yeah. crisis next? Let us know. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and we're doing it anyway. But let us know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> what is it about crisis that you want us to talk about? Yeah, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, it's Firebrand and Salva and nothing else. <laughs> Oh, God, I love that comment so much. <laughs> <laughs>
So, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll wrap up here then. Um, yeah, let us know what your first comic was. Like they said, what got you into comics? What do you think of Crisis? And um, I guess we'll see you back here soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>